Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today's discussion is called 10 Rules to Having a Really Great Fight. Now, this may sound unusual to you because why is a rabbi or anyone telling you how to fight well? So we're going to see that fighting and arguing, losing our tempers is normal, understandable, but there are rules. There are things that you can do and things that you should refrain from doing. And that is going to be our discussion today. Actually, the majority of the ideas will come from my book over here, uh, which is actually backwards if you're on Instagram or on Facebook Live. But my second book was called Will You Marry Me? Which is a guide to dating, relationships, love and marriage. And one thing I found I was dealing with while dealing with people who are dating, about to get married, especially actually in preparation for getting married, preparing the wedding itself, when you go from this lovely dating, fun, enjoyable hanging out to dealing with guests and family and money and everyone gets involved. These are stressful times. These are stressful times for sure. So how to deal with the fights and the arguments that come up between friends, family. But today I think we're going to more focus on couples in relationships. That's going to be the focus over here of how exactly to fight. I, I want to start, however, if I may, with um, we are in the Shloshim, the 30 days since the passing of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Um, anyone who knows me even a little bit will know that I was a big devotee of this very, very great uh, and brilliant genius and tzaddik of an individual. Uh, he gave me my first ever approbation, has come off my first book, which he very kindly did. And uh, I've met him a number of times and spoken to him. A very, very special individual. So the past week, I've been binge watching a lot of his classes and lectures. He gave a TED talk some years ago, and he opened the TED talk with words which I think were profound um, and are quite relevant to today's topic. He said, if you type into your Google search or your Amazon search and write in the words self-help, you're going to get a list of hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of books that are all in the self-help category. So if these thousands of books are being written, and one can assume that more than 100 people is reading, reading each one, we assume, that means millions of people right across our nation are reading books on self-help. And yet, if you ask most people, most people are upset, frustrated, irritated, angry. So where's all this information? So he gave a very profound answer. And he said, maybe because following the way of looking for self-help is the mistake that we are making. Maybe we shouldn't be looking and focusing on self-help and self-help, but instead help for others. Maybe this self-help thing has led us into having big, fat egos. And what we should focus on is other help, helping other people. And this idea of ego, my friends, is really going to be one of the challenges that's going to lead to, when it comes to fight, other areas for sure, but when it comes to fighting and arguing, being the main catalyst for creating the fight, maintaining the fight, and sustaining it for weeks, months, and I'll tell you, years. I mean, I know fights that have been, been gone down through generations, let alone that. So that was his, his chidush, that was his idea that he gave. He, either way, he mentioned something else, by the way, which ended up becoming, a, becoming international news. He said that we even see this by the device that we use. Right? Look at the Apple devices. You have the iPhone and the iPad and the iMac. Yeah, it's all about the I, I, I. And he says maybe this is indicative of us not caring much about other people, but being involved in ourselves, right, and our own, uh, our own egos. By the way, he got nat international press for this, and the Daily Mail did a whole article. Rabbi Sachs goes against and fights Apple. I think he was talking tongue-in-cheek. He wasn't trying to bring down all of uh, Apple by making this comment, but it was definitely truth we had to say. 
We are living in the I generation. It's all about me. And when it comes to our relationships with others, helping others, and tonight's, today's topic, fighting other people, we're going to see that there's a lot more to this. Now, I, um, I, I, I read something about an individual who had decided to become a soccer referee. And the reason he had done this was because that he had felt it wasn't money that motivated him to do it, because soccer ref referees, especially the Lowells, don't make too much money. But he realized there was a defect in his personality. And the defect was that he was taking things too personally. Anytime anyone made any comment, you may have heard the expression, right? He or she is a snowflake. Anything happens, take it very, very personally. And he found himself losing his temper, right? And getting into bad fights. So he decided that the way to combat this was to become a soccer referee. Why? Because soccer referees, and I'm sure this is true for other sports too. I'm sure it's true for football referees and basketball referees are lightning rods for people getting angry with them. Shouting at them, you don't know what they're talking about. Go back to where you came from. You know nothing about soccer, about basketball, about football. You know nothing at all, right? You better learn the rules. And they'll be cursed at and shouted and sometimes even physically abused. And he said that when he became a soccer referee, he started to learn the important principle of don't take everything so personally. It's not about you. And the more he practiced by being in these soccer matches and being shouted at and abused by the players and the crowd, right? What do you know? Get off the field. Keep your day job. The more he started to thicken his own skin and realize that, why am I taking this person? They don't know who I am. They know nothing about me, right? It could be anyone else standing over getting the same abuse. Don't take it personally. And I, I think this idea of not taking it personally, although it's not one of the 15, or maybe it overrides all of them, uh, the 10 rules of having a good fight, this idea of not taking it personally is so, so important. You know, there you are in traffic, and you get honked at continually by the person behind you. And what do you immediately do? Hey, what are you honking me for? What are you saying? You think, I don't know how to drive? You think, I don't know what I'm doing over here? What are you taking it personally for? They're just honking because they think you're going too slow, right? Don't take it personally, right? It's not all about you. It's your ego. This me aspect of your personality that says it's all about me. And if you talk to me that way, it's all about me. And therefore, I'm going to get angry with you. I'm going to lose it with you because you're insulting me. But what I want to tell you today, that it's not about me. Turn the me or the M of me upside down. It's all about we. And once you start to put yourself into other people, maybe the person behind you is late for a very important appointment. Maybe they don't feel so well. Maybe they're going to visit someone. Maybe they're having a heart attack. Maybe they're nuts. Most people out there are crazy. I mentioned this before. I'll say it again. I categorize everyone that I meet as crazy and if they end up being not being crazy that's just an added bonus okay so even like a baby right we've all held babies in our arms and you know babies have very very sharp nails some people put gloves on their babies when they sleep because they scratch themselves imagine a baby scratches you in the face what are you gonna do you're gonna rationalize hey you just hurt me it's a baby it doesn't know what it's doing don't take it personally. Don't get into a fight with a baby. Dare I say it, most people, and irrespective of age, prestige, I've seen great successful people lose their tempers. I've seen very smart people, professors and rabbis and everything else in between. Lose, don't take it personally. I was, um, I was on a Pesach, I was a rabbi of a Pesach program for the past five, six years. And I was on a Pesach program once, somewhere in a very warm climate, which is an important part of the story. And I was walking out the elevator. And as I walked out the elevator, I accidentally brushed, literally brushed upon someone's arm. And the person went, ow! That, that really hurt me. 
you just, you just heard me, Rabbi. And I thought to myself, get a life. I didn't say it. But I thought, get a life. I just touched your arm. What are you getting upset about? Later on, this person approached me at dinner and said, I want to apologize for the way I acted towards you. But I just went sunbathing and I burnt my arm. And when you touched upon my arm, my shoulder, it kind of shocked me and it hurt me. My friends, I accept their apology. Most people today, nearly everyone today actually, is suffering from emotional sunburn. There is a part of their personality that you're going to say something or do something and it's going to trigger a reaction that you never saw coming. Especially when it comes to relationships and spouses. You're going to say something one day, make a comment, and you'll think it's an innocent comment. I just brushed upon their arm and they're going to explode at you. If you have an ego, if you're suffering from ego problems, you won't let that comment just go by, which you should, and you're going to end up getting into a fight. Don't take it personally. It's not about you. You didn't create the situation. Get over it. Let go. That is number one. So we're actually before we even get into a fight. Try not get into a fight because realizing that, don't take it personally. The person who spoke speaking to you or has said these words to you which are about to trigger the fight inside you are just touching a part of your personality and it's not about you. You know, the Gemara says there's three ways to evaluate a person's personality. Kiss, cuss, cuss. Kiss is pocket, how they spend their money. You can get a very good insight into the person you are getting to know, friendship or relationship, by seeing where they spend the money, how they spend it, who they give it away to, if they give it away at all, right? The way people relate to money is very telling of their personality. Second is cost, which means cup, which means get to see what they're like when they're drunk. Now, I wouldn't suggest getting drunk or trying to get your partner drunk in a relationship. Maybe date through Purim, and maybe on Purim you'll see the what a person's like or they drunk too much. But the third is cast. What a person is like when they're angry. You're going to get to learn a lot about a person when they enter into situations and challenges and frustrations, whether it's traffic or being stuck behind a person in the supermarket and not being able to fight, whatever it is. You're going to get to know a lot about a person by seeing what, get, what gets them angry and how they act when they are fighting. You're going to learn a lot about an individual by seeing that part of their, of their personality. Okay, so... Let's move on by saying that there is a mission in Pirikavot that tells us the world can actually be divided, all people in the world can be divided up into four groups. Four groups. Okay. There are people who get angry very quickly and there are people who, but they calm down quickly. There are people who get angry slowly. It takes a lot to get them angry, but they calm down slowly. It takes a long time to get them to calm down. There's people who get angry quickly, but calm down slowly. And the fourth of them, people who get angry Slowly, but calm down quickly. Those are your four groupings, says the Mishnah in Pirik Avot. Now, the Mishnah then tries to figure out who's the best of the four, and you can assume, says the Mishnah. Actually, this Mishnah refers to such people as a Hasid, Hasidim. That doesn't mean they walk around with fairy hats on. They weren't a Hasidim in the days of the Mishnah. It means they acted righteously with the people who got angry slowly, it took a lot to get them angry, and once they did they get angry, they calm down quickly. That's the best. And the worst of the four, obviously, is the opposite. People who get angry very, very, very quickly and it takes a long time to calm them down. One of them, of Farshim, has a very interesting question. One of the commentators says, well, why are there only four categories? Why isn't there a fifth category? What would that be? People who don't get angry at all. They have no cuss, no anger. And the answer is, of course, is the Rambam. There are no such people. Everyone is going to get angry and start a fight at some point. It's just part of it. The question is not if you get into a fight, but when and how you fight. How you actually fight. So that's going to be, that is the introduction to our discussion today, is when you have ego, that's the worst recipe because it's all about me. You talk to me. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? 
right? That part of a person, the ego is going to be the catalyst for the worst anger and the worst fights. Actually, the Rambam says, all character traits, all midot, have a positive application. God wouldn't just give us a bad character trait and then say, hey, good luck with that. For example, we have jealousy. We spoke about jealousy before. There's bad jealousy, being jealous of people's things, what they own. And there's good jealousy, kinat sofrim, of who people are. Wow, I wish I could pray like that. I wish I could act nicer. I wish I was caring and giving like that person. That's jealousy. That's a good jealousy. So too, there are people who have I don't know, problems when it comes to how they act towards other people and act in various ways. And we're like, you know what? You can learn from that negative behavior to become a good person. There's always a good application, even not believing in God. Right? One of the great Hasidic masters says, where's the positive application of not believing in God? I'll tell you when. When you're suffering, believe in God. But when your friend is suffering, don't believe in God. Think to yourself, God's not going to help them. God doesn't exist. I have to help them. So even that, kathira, right, has a positive application. But he says, anger and fighting, there's very little good that comes out of that. You're going to have to work on that area very, very hard. You're going to have to go to the extreme because anger, kas, and ego, ga'ava, are married together. Every time you see anger and fighting, ego has got in the way. You need to humble yourself and realize you're not that great. Okay? So with that in mind, let's begin our list of 10 rules of fighting when it comes to having a really good fight. Number one is don't fight in public. Now, I know that if you look online today and you see people, everyone's fighting in public, right? You're constantly, everyone's being filmed at it. Everyone's being noted, fighting. Don't fight. Fighting is something, an argument, disagreeing fervently is understandable, but don't get into fights in public. When I say don't do it in public, I mean not even in front of your children, right? Forget the neighbors, right? Even in front of your children. How much damage have I heard? People tell me that when they grew up, their parents were always fighting and they saw it. They don't need to see it, right? It can very adversely affect and impact a person. By the way, I'll mention that embarrassing somebody in public, according to Judaism, is akin to killing them, to shvichut damim. Embarrassing a person in public, which fighting does, is seen as one of the worst things you can do. And children, by the way, who are embarrassed in public, is one of the worst things you could do to them. Embarrassing a child, which is hard for a parent because I love to embarrass my kids, not in a bad way, right? But we all like it. However, bringing a person embarrassment and making their face white, making the blood drain from them or come up to the face in Judaism is like a killing that person. It's one of the worst things you can do. Worst thing you can do to each other. So do not fight in public. Wait, hold it in, and then take it indoors. No one needs to see your domestic problems in public. I've been at Shabbat dinners. I've seen people and I tell you something, I am shocked by some of the things people say to each other in public. It's not acceptable. Okay, you got to think to yourself. I'd rather, the Gemara tells us, that Tamar, the story of Tamar and Yehuda in the Torah, she could have embarrassed Yehuda publicly. She preferably threw herself into her own personal danger of life just not to embarrass a person. Arguing and fighting people in public is seen as a terrible, terrible thing. That's number one. Number one rule. Number two rule is, we all know this instinctively, but it's worth it again. Whatever you do, don't fight hungry, right? My mother would say to me when I want something for my father as a child, don't ask for things when people are hungry. If you're not going to get very, very far. Let your abba come in, sit down, have a day, then ask for what you want. Right? I know when parents walk in, the kids, oh, I'll buy one. I'm like, oh, that ain't going to work. Right? Same is true for one's spouse. Don't fight hungry. Right? Because if you are hangry, it's going to be much, much worse. Find your times and your, you know, once a month, my wife and I sit down to pay the bills. Generally speaking, this can end up becoming a bit of a fight and battle. 
You spent out, and we spent, and we're spending too much. So we're careful, first of all, to keep our money in a box. I don't mean a physical box. We keep our money in a bank account. I mean to know when to talk about things like money, because a lot of fights can come up around money spending and lack thereof. By the way, even if you've got a lot of money, I people with a lot of money still fight. It's not dependent on how much you have. It depends on how you spend it, right? But especially when it comes to don't get into big, serious discussions when you are hungry. It's going to lead to a lot of other problems there are too. That's number two. Number three is keep it relevant. Now, people have this thought process, and this is a big problem, and this is a learnable skill. They think that once they're fighting, they can say or do anything. Once we're fighting, I can say whatever I want. I can bring up that thing you did to me two years ago where you said you were going to, and you never. This can lead to a big spiral. I know relationships that go through weeks or months of, of repair based upon one comment of one thing that you bring up about the other person that happened weeks, months, or years ago. Okay, Just because you're fighting, that doesn't mean that people think we're arguing, gloves come off, I'll say whatever I want. Keep it relevant. Try to figure out what you're figuring out about now. Try to cool things down. But keep it relevant to the matter at hand. Right? I want to add a little addendum to this. And this is specifically for people who are married. There are some things you never say in a fight. There are some things that are so taboo. No matter how angry you are. No matter how bad this fight. No matter how deep it's going in. You're going to have one of those fights. Those people who have been married for a few years have been at the receiving end of this. There's some things you just don't bring up. Those things could be personal that you know are going to trigger a terrible, terrible reaction. That's subjective. But objectively, there's some things you don't say. For example, one word that does not come up in a fight, and I've heard people do this in fights, even in front of me when I'm counseling couples, you don't use the D word. The D word does not come up. What's the D word? Divorce. That word should not come into not only a fight, but it shouldn't even come into your home. I have this habit that when anyone talks about the word, I'm like, oh, don't say that word. It's not a viable option. Even if it is, you don't say it and you don't threaten with it. That's an example. You and your own personal relationships, you know what buttons are pressed in order to really anger and upset your spouse or your friend, your relationship, or your boss, or your employee. Don't do it. Just because you're fighting, that doesn't give you license to bring up every previous fight and every argument ever had in order to make your point. Fighting is not a free-for-all. You can't curse each other and get angry with each other, thinking if we're fighting, if I'm fighting already, I might as well keep on doing it. Okay? Related to this is our next one, and that is avoid character assassination. Now, this is difficult, right? Because naturally, when we're fighting, we do this. You are such a beep, right? That you, and it's you, you, you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to win this fight by bringing you down. Because when I destroy your character, you're going to see that I'm right. Because as we said at the beginning of our talk, every fight is really all about ego. If you didn't have an ego problem, you wouldn't be fighting. You'd be able to just like not take it personally. And you said this about me and it goes over my head. Unfortunately, we live in a world where everyone is suffering from chronic and debilitating low self-esteem. You see, what you're going to have to figure out and this is great advice for life. This is, this is gold. Is when people say things to us and our egos get in the way and we take it personally, what we do is we create a story. And this could be if someone's honking you, right, in the car behind you, or they'll make one comment or one joke. We create a story. And the story is valid, by the way. It's not an insane story, 
but it's a story nonetheless. When we take it personally, the story create is, and the Rambam, by the way, in his writings alludes to this in a few places. He says that every time you get angry, every time you get into a fight, it's hevel havalim, it's steam. Hevel is nonsense, vanity, but the word hevel is steam. What is steam? It looks real, right? And it feels, but it's, there's nothing there, it's just vapor. Every comment that is made to us, we have to be like, I'm just going to let it go. It's just not worth the fight and the irritation. It's not about me. But we make a story and we put so much effort in being a story. It must be that I am this way that they say this to me, so I'm going to fight back. And it must be that if they say this to me, there's something wrong with... I, uh, I teach at Yeshima University in the girls' school for nearly 20 years. And a girl came to me um, because the room that she was, they, they share rooms, two, three, four, five people in a room sometimes, sharing an apartment together. And she walked into a room and there were two girls who were whispering, right? And they came up to her and they said, you know, we don't want you in our room. We have a better friend. We were in the room. We wanted to leave the room, right? We wanted to take a bed in another room because there was a... And she was devastated about this. And she came to see me and I saw she was very, very upset, right? Swollen eyes and tears and snot bubble, the whole thing. And I said to her, what happened? And she says, Rabbi, it was horrible. I'm in the room. I unpacked all my stuff and I've been there for two, three days and the girls were so mean and so nasty that they asked me to leave the room and I took a... By the way, most people at the school are not like this. This was an incident. And I said... No, no, I asked you what happened. And she said, I told you what happened. They were very mean and they asked me to leave the room. I said, no, you told me a story. We create stories. I'm not good and everyone hates me and I've never got many friends anywhere. And we all create stories. What happened is we have to keep it relevant. What happened? What happened was you walk into a room, you unpack your bags, you put your clothing on the shelves, put your books out. Two people said some words to you. You repacked your suitcase, you picked up your books and you walked out to another room. That's what happened. But we do is we create these stories of ourselves and every argument, every comment, every statement. We take it personally. It's all about us. You know, our egos are hurt and our self-esteem is, is challenged. And really we have to figure out is what happened. This is good advice to everything in life. Right? We all suffer from rejection and rejection leads us to want to fight. But in the end, it's most cases not about us. It's really their problem. You know, when I came to America, I mentioned this before, I heard the statement, you make me so mad. You know, Americans say that. You make me so mad. I always say, what do you mean I make you so mad? I said something to you. You got angry. You try to get into a fight. Or we go into a fight. But you make yourself mad. What do you mean you make me so mad? When we're fighting, we have this um, thing where we think we need to win the fight, right? Like anything in life. You start a game, you want to win. You start a project, you want to finish it. However, sometimes the fight is open and we may have won it. Our arguments may have outweighed. By the way, I'll mention one thing, by the way, just a side point, but so important. You know, fights and arguments are not rational, they're emotional. Even the most rational people are really emotional beings. We're not rational beings. We are emotional beings. So just because you think you've bought, won the fight. So I want to mention related to that idea that you have to allow your partner, whoever you're fighting with, to retreat with dignity. What we try to do sometimes is really fight back and crush them and hold them off. And I want a new seat, right? Allow. Sorry, I just went offline over here. Sorry about that. Sorry, everyone. My internet connection is weak today. So I'm not sure why. The goal is not to destroy your partner, whoever you're arguing with. You're, you want to express a point, and you've got to be forceful in that sometimes. The Gemara tells us that a Talmud Chacham who doesn't fight and doesn't fight for the cause, is not a Talmud Chacham, is not a Torah scholar. Sometimes you've got to put your kishkas into it and fight off. But the end of the argument is as important as the beginning. At some point, you've got to offer an olive branch 
and not think that the argument is won when I've crushed the person and they no longer exist, right? Give them room to retreat and don't give off. And sometimes making a joke at the end of a fight or an argument or self-deprecation is gonna, gonna help you do that. Related to this is my next point is, we've got to be, and I've not overrun my time, proportional in our intensity, right? You've got to be proportional in, in how much you fight and give up. There's some people who are bale machloket. They just get into fights all the time and they won't give up and they're intense in it. You've got to figure out a way when fighting arguing of how much intensity to put into that argument, right? Not everything is an earth shattering topic that needs to be fought to the death. You don't need to have the same desire when discussing, yes, underwear on the floor, right? Socks on the floor, in the, right? And political stuff. I mean, in the end, I know we've come through this period of people really arguing about politics. I'm gonna let you in a secret. It's really not that relevant to most of us. These people don't care about us. They, as individuals, they say they do, they're politicians, okay? Most politicians don't really care about you. There's got to be a limit to the political fights we get into. I know people get very, very passionate, very angry, and I too among them have a lot of principles, but in the end, it's politics, right? And politics is two words, poly, which means many, and ticks are blood-sucking creatures. That's what politics is in the end. Take it easy. I see people online going crazy, fighting families, and we're all passionate and have our opinions, but in the end, don't let these people live in your head rent-free. You can have an opinion, but in the end, I'll be honest with you, they don't know who you are. You're never gonna meet them. Take it easy, okay? Keep it all proportionate. Next is don't blame, okay? We saw the first fight in world history was between Adam and Eve. We know that God said, Adam and Eve, don't eat from the fruit of the tree. And we know that the Satan, the, in that time, in the form of a snake, came forward and said, go on, have a bite. And she did, and then he did, and then God said to them, hey, what happened? And Eve said, it wasn't me, it was a snake. All right? Eve said, and Adam said, it wasn't me, it was her. And they blamed each other. You know, the deep rabbis say, had they not tried to blame each other, but taken responsibility for their actions and fought with responsibility, they would have stayed in Gan Eden. The fact that they blamed each other led to their downfall and their exile from the Garden of Eden. Don't blame. Try to take responsibility for what the circumstances you have found yourself in that have led you to this fight in the first place, okay? When you confront your partner, don't make him or her wrong. Try to own it yourself, okay? You act like such an idiot. You said that to her and you did that. We're constantly in this blame game and constantly comparing each other to each other to other people. Compare leads to despair, okay? I wanna mention, Take a, make a time limit, okay? Fights can go on a long time. You know, before I got married, and I do this with the couples, I, I always say, you, you, and those people who know I'm talking, I'm talking about, try your very, very, very best not to go to bed angry. Try, if possible, at the end of the day to calm down the fights. And I'll mention, for married people specifically, there should not be a case where you sleep in another room, okay? I know we joke about it. I was on the couch last night. I was in the doghouse, the kennel, right? It gets worse. This jokes aside should never happen. No one partner should leave them no matter how bad, how angry you are. Even if you're not able to establish the fight, you don't sleep in other rooms. You can discuss that before to repay yourself no matter how bad the fight is. No one sleeps in the basement, right? or anyone else, okay? Which leads us to another point, and we're gonna finish with this soon, don't threaten abandonment, okay? Even temporary abandonment. If you don't do this for me, I'm gonna leave, and I'm out of here, right? I'm going out, and I don't know when I'm coming back, right? That's not 
Now, we may need space to calm down, which is a good thing to do when you're fighting. Sometimes you've got to remove yourself from the heat of the situation to cool yourself down. That's okay, okay? You can say, I'm going out and I'll be back in an hour or so, right? But I don't know when I'm coming back. That's abandonment. Most people, today especially, are suffering from the fear of abandonment. So you don't want to bring that up in your fighting as well. And finally, I don't know if this is 10, it could be more. If it is, there's a free bonus. You want to communicate and fight and limit what you have to say in as few sentences as possible. When you're angry, put your ego down. Humble yourself. Love for emotional. By the way, I should mention this. One of the people who most famously was threatened with more fights than anyone else, else was Moshe Rabbeinu. You look at the Torah, he had more, as a great leader, and as great leaders do, right, they are threatened with fights all the time from their followers. And Moshe Rabbeinu never rose and fought back. He was, when Korach, for example, tried to threaten Moshe Rabbeinu, he was always able, and the reason is, says the Torah, because he has one trait that he was the master in, and that was anivut humility. Actually, he wasn't only humble. He was the humblest person that ever stepped foot on the earth, says the Torah. That's how the Torah, how God himself describes Moshe Rabbeinu. It was that quality of a great leader that he was able to humble himself. And when people like Korach and other people, Das and Aviram, came to fight him, the first thing he did was fell on his face on the floor because he realized it wasn't about him. It was about his position of leadership. It's not about, in 99% of the cases, it's not about you. You're projecting your own insecurities, your own egos that are making you react to the situation this way. Okay? So keep it short, keep it simple, and keep a time and a word limit on how ang on, on your anger and your fighting. Don't blame, don't threaten abandonment. Some things you just cannot say. Keep it simple. And realize that, and don't fight in public, don't fight hungry, and avoid character assassination. Those are our short rules for having a really good and effective fight. Thank you very, very much. Have a great and successful day.